Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the A.O. Smith 2019 Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Patricia Ackerman, Senior Vice President, Investor Relations, Corporate Responsibility, and Sustainability, and Treasurer. Please go ahead, ma'am. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us on our 2019 results conference call. With me participating in the call are Kevin Wheeler, Chief Executive Officer, and Chuck Lauber, Chief Financial Officer. Before I begin, I would like to remind you that some of the comments that will be made during this conference call, including answers to your questions, will constitute forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks that could cause actual results to be materially different. Those risks include, among others, matters that we have described in this morning's press release. In order to provide improved transparency into the operating results of our business, we provided non-GAAP measures adjusted net earnings, adjusted earnings per share, per share, and adjusted segment earnings for 2018 that exclude the restructuring and impairment costs associated with our plant closure in Renton, Washington. Recon reconciliations from GAAP measures to non-GAAP measures are provided in the appendix at the end of this presentation and also on our website. Also, as a courtesy to others in the question queue, Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up per turn. If you have multiple questions, please rejoin the queue. I will now turn the call over to Kevin, who will begin our prepared remarks on slide four. Thank you, Pat, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to review several items regarding our 2019 performance. Sales in our North America segment increased 2%, and operating margin performance in North America improved 50 basis points compared with 2018. Our North America water heater operations continue to perform well. I'm particularly pleased with our performance despite a 1% decline in residential industry volumes. Productivity within our North America water treatment manufacturing and the effectiveness of our direct-to-consumer channel continue to improve. We expanded our North America water treatment platform with the acquisition of WaterRight and performance is right on track to our expectations. We announced a 9% increase to our quarterly dividend rate in early October to $0.24 cents per share, which represents a five-year CAGR of 24%. In China, the fourth quarter came in where we expected, with channel inventory declining by more than one month. Channel inventory ended 2019 within the normal range of two to three months of sales. I will now turn the call to Chuck, who will review the results in more detail on slide five. Chuck? Thank you, Kevin. Sales for the year are $3 billion, were 6% lower than in 2018. Adjusted earnings in 2019 of $370 million declined 18% from 2018. 2019 adjusted earnings per share of $2.22 were 15% lower than in 2018. Sales in our North America segment of $2.1 billion increased 2% compared with 2018. The acquisition of WaterRight in April added $44 million to 2019 sales. The increase in sales is primarily due to incremental sales from recently acquired WaterRight, water heating pricing actions related to steel and freight cost increases, and higher sales of water treatment products, which were partially offset by lower residential water heater volume. Rest of the world segment sales of 936 million declined 20% compared with the segment sales in 2018. China sales declined 19% in local currency, primarily related to weaker end market demand, elevated channel inventory levels at the beginning of 2019, as well as a higher mix of mid-priced products. The weaker Chinese currency unfavorably impacted translated sales by approximately 39 million. India sales grew approximately 13% in constant currency compared with the same period in 2018. On slide eight, North America segment earnings of 489 million 
were 4% higher than adjusted segment earnings in 2018. The favorable impact from pricing actions, lower steel costs, and higher sales of water treatment products, including the acquisition, were partially offset by the unfavorable impact from lower residential heater volumes. As a result, segment margins of 23.5% increased 50 basis points compared with 2018. Rest of the world earnings of 40 million declined significantly compared with 2018. The impact to profits from lower China sales and a higher mix of mid-priced products, which have lower margin, more than offset the benefits to profits from lower SG&A expenses and material costs. Weaker China currency translation negatively impacted earnings by approximately 3 million. As a result of these factors, segment margin declined significantly from 2018. Our corporate expenses were lower in 2019 compared to 2018, primarily due to lower incentive costs. The effective tax rate in 2019 of 21.6 percent was higher than the 20.4 percent rate in 2018, primarily due to differences in geographic distribution of income. Our fourth quarter results begin on slide nine. Sales for the fourth quarter of $751 million were 8% lower than the same period in 2018. Earnings in the fourth quarter of $91 million declined 28% from the fourth quarter in 2018. And fourth quarter earnings per share declined 24% to $0.56. Cents. Sales in our North America segment of $523 million were essentially flat compared with the fourth quarter of 2018. Incremental sales of approximately 14 million from water right and growth in water treatment sales were offset by lower boiler volumes and lower contractual formula pricing based on lower steel costs associated with a portion of a water heater sales. Rest of the world segment sales of 234 million declined 21% compared with the same quarter in 2018. China sales declined 23% in local currency, primarily related to weak consumer demand entering the quarter with elevated channel inventory levels and a higher mix of mid-priced products. The weaker Chinese currency unfavorably impacted translated sales by 4 million. On slide 11, North America's segment earnings of 129 million grew 1% compared with the segment earnings in the same quarter in 2018. The net favorable impact to profits from lower steel costs essentially offset the unfavorable impact to profits from the lower boiler volumes. As a result, fourth quarter 2019 segment margin of 24.5% was the same as in the fourth quarter of 2018. Rest of the world earnings of $2 million declined significantly compared with the fourth quarter of 2018. Earnings were lower primarily due to the unfavorable impact to profits from lower China sales a higher mix of lower margin products and charges associated with customer support programs to reduce channel inventory along with severance and other costs in the quarter. These unfavorable impacts to profits more than offset the benefit to profits from lower SG&A expenses and material costs. As a result of these factors, segment margins declined to 1% compared to 13.3% in the same quarter of 2018. Our corporate expenses of $12 million were higher compared with fourth quarter 2018, primarily due to lower interest income earned on cash as a result of lower balances. Interest costs were higher in the fourth quarter than the previous year due to higher debt levels associated with the acquisition of water right in early April. Cash provided by operations of $456 million during 2019 was slightly higher than $449 million in 2018. Lower investment in working capital essentially offset lower earnings compared with 2018. Our liquidity and balance sheet remained strong. Our debt to capital ratio was 15% at the end of the year. We have cash balances totaling $551 million, primarily located offshore and our net cash position was $267 million at the end of 2019. During 2019, we repurchased approximately 6.1 million shares of common stock for a total of $288 million. Approximately 3 million shares remain on our existing repurchase authority at the end of 2019. We expect our cash flow from operations in 2020 to be between $475 million and $500 million 
compared with 450 in 2019, primarily due to higher earnings. Our 2020 capital spending plans are approximately 80 million, and our depreciation and amortization expense is expected to be approximately 85 million in 2020. Our corporate and other expenses are expected to be approximately 50 million in 2020, higher than 2019, primarily due to lower interest income on investments and higher incentive compensation. We expect our interest expense will be 10 million in 2020 compared with 11 million in 2019. Our effective income tax rate is expected to be between 21.5 and 22% in 2020. We expect to repurchase our shares in the amount of 200 million in 2020, and we expect our diluted average outstanding shares in 2020 will be approximately 162 million. As weakness in our end markets in China persisted, we implemented several cost reduction actions in 2019. Over the course of 2019 and through Q1 of 2020, we reduced headcount by nearly 20% from December 2018 levels. We continue to review and rationalize brand building and advertising spending, selling expenses, and other SG&A costs. We closed over, four, over 700 non-productive stores on a net basis. We are continuing our existing aggressive cost reduction programs in both manufacturing processes and in product costs. And we continue to evaluate our retail footprint and rationalize where we find non-productive stores with redundancy. To that end, we expect to close 1,000 net stores in 2020. Compared with 2018, total annualized savings as a result of these actions is estimated to be approximately $45 million in 2020, of which approximately $30 million was realized in 2019. We introduced our, our 2020 EPS guidance this morning with a range of between $2.40 and $2.50 per share, a 10% increase at the midpoint compared with last year. Our 2020 EPS guidance excludes any potential impact to our businesses from the developing coronavirus originating in China. I will now turn the call to Kevin, who will summarize our guidance and business assumptions for 2020, beginning on slide 16. Kevin? All right. Thank you, Chuck. Our outlook for 2020 includes the following assumptions, and I'll start with China. China inventory levels ended 2019 between two and three months of sales, meeting our expectations after being as high as four months in the second half of 2018 and earlier in 2019. As we stated, our customers tell us normal levels are between two and three months. We estimate sell-in will be modestly lower than sell-out, resulting in a modest further decline in channel inventory levels. We project China's sales growth in local currency of 2.5%. Our forecast for the China currency is a modest depreciation from today's levels, resulting in a 1% increase in U.S. dollar terms. In China, as we walk forward from the fourth quarter of 2019 to the first quarter of 2020, and with the Chinese New Year holidays earlier in the quarter, and our continued focus on monitoring channel inventory, we project first quarter China volume will be approximately $40 million lower than the fourth quarter of 2019. The earnings impact in the 2020 first quarter from lower volumes is expected to be 50% of the sales decline. In addition, also compared to the fourth quarter of 2019, we do not expect customer support programs, severance charges, or other certain costs of approximately $10 million to repeat. After a 1% decline in 2019, we project residential water heater volumes will increase 225,000 to 275,000 units in 2020, driven by incremental new construction and expansion of replacement demand in line with historical trends. Commercial industry water heater volumes are expected to grow 2 to 3%, primarily driven by growth in electric models. We expect our North America boiler sales to grow approximately 8% for the full year. In 2019, our boiler sales were flat with low single-digit growth in condensing boilers. 
several factors underpin our 2020 forecasts. We believe the transition from lower efficiency to higher efficiency boilers continues, and commercial condensing boiler volumes grow mid-single digits as they have historically. The ABI data has been recently strong and encouraging. We will enhance our product offering in 2020, such as adding O2 sensing capability on our commercial condensing boilers, which addresses a gap in our product portfolio that we believe impacted us in 2019. We continue to work with our reps to improve our visibility to track jobs. We are seeing and hearing that many projects in 2019 have been pushed into the first half of 2020. We ended 2019 with a $2.6 million loss in India, and we are on track with our expectations to break even in that region in 2020. As the Indian economy has shown signs of weakness recently, we are monitoring our progress towards this goal carefully. Please advance to slide 17. We project revenues will increase by approximately 45 to 5.5% in 2020. We see sales growth in North America with our water heater, boiler, and water treatment products collectively expected to grow approximately 6% in 2020 including $20 million in water rights sales, which was acquired in April of 2019. EPS is projected to be between $2.40 and $2.50. Our EPS guidance excludes the potential impact to our businesses from the developing coronavirus originating in China. We expect North America's segment margin to be between 23 and a quarter and 24 and a quarter percent and rest of the world segment margins to be approximately 5%. We are pleased with how our North America segment is performing, particularly on the water heating side. We see long-term growth drivers in water treatment solutions and boilers across North America. In the near term, the Chinese economy remains weak. We have a strong premium brand, broad product offering in our key product categories, broad distribution, and a reputation for quality and innovation. Over time, we are well positioned to maximize favorable demographics in both China and India to enhance shareholder value. Our replacement markets remain stable, which we believe represents approximately 85% of North America water heater and boiler volumes. We have strong cash flow and balance sheet, providing an opportunity to continue to invest in ourselves, acquisitions, return cash to shareholders. That concludes our prepared remarks, and we are now available for your questions. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question comes from Sari Brodsky with Jeffries. Please proceed with your question. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning. morning. It may be too early for this, but just given your commentary around guidance, have you seen any disruption in your supply chain or any impact on retail sales as a result of the coronavirus? Uh, Let me take this in in kind of the order that the way we think about it. Um, First, um, the coronavirus, our focus is on our employees and particularly the 7,000 employees we have in China. So we uh, were focused on safety and doing the right things to make sure um, that our employees are safe during these these uh, difficult times. Secondly, to answer your question, um, at, at this time, our supply chain, we see no issues uh, currently and in, in going forward. So as we look at it right now, um, no immediate disruption expected by us at all. Great. And then... Given the decline in boilers in the quarter, can you provide some color on what you're seeing in that market that gives you confidence in the rebound for 2020 and maybe what you're seeing from a backlog or quoting perspective? Uh, Yeah, sure. Uh, From the boiler perspective, I'm going to kind of look back on on the year a bit. And first, when the industry, we we kept pace with the industry, particularly in the commercial boiler sector. Um, This year, we... As an organization, um, our product makes skews to, uh, to more lower um, BTU models. 
And quite a few of our larger jobs this year, as I mentioned in the comments, have been pushed into the first quarter and the second half of the year. So, and on top of that, our, our reps and our customers remain bullish about the, their activity. Is, and and in, as far as the, uh, the market, job quoting and so forth remains, remains active. And then on top of that, we are introducing a O2 sensing device that, that goes on to our, our, our high uh, commercial uh, condensing boilers. So when you put all that together, the, the market, the ABI index, uh, we had an unusually skewed uh, to lower BTUs this year. Uh, some projects that were delayed in the second half, we're, we're, uh, we believe 8% is a reasonable number as we get into 2020. Yeah, and this is Chuck. I mean, we still can see, you know, that the higher efficiency boilers uh, moving away from the less efficient non-condensing boilers to higher efficiency where we focus, we still see that trend. Thank you. And our next question comes from Scott Graham with Rosenblatt Securities. Please proceed with your question. Kevin, Chuck, Pat, how are you? Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Thank uh, you. Hey, so I, I do have two questions around the organic guidance. Um, you know, the U.S. business you guys are looking for, um, you know, an up year looks like in the 2 to 3% vicinity. Could you, you know, in past conference calls, I think last one in particular, you talked about what your estimate was for the replacement business only for the last two years. I think it was 4% each. What did that number come in on for 2019, and what's baked into your 2020 on the replacement only? Well, if you look back at it, back at it the, this year was um, our guidance was for overall replacement to come in about 100 to 150,000 units down this year, and we feel it's going to fall in that range once everything is published. If you look at it, you're right. 2017, 2018 were well above market average, uh, growing four to five percent. It's not unreasonable to have a correction as we did in uh, in 2019. So as we go forward, we're basically saying there's a reasonable new construction activity. Uh, builders remain confident, and that our historical replacement market will return to their normal levels. That's what's baked into our, our guidance. Yeah, if you take the mid-range of the residential units, that, that 250 range, and you put 100,000 into, into new construction, new housing, and you add the rest to the replacement, you don't, you don't quite get back to the 2018 levels. So, you know, we're kind of in between that. That's a, that's a sharp answer. Thank you. I appreciate that. So on the China business, looks like we're going to start in the hole again in the first quarter, not unexpected. Um, but you are expecting the China organic to be up, you know, two and a half on a full year basis. So, what is your thinking as to when those sales pivot upward? Could that be as early as the second quarter? And, and I'm asking that, you know, with a backdrop of mix likely staying negative as well, it looks like China completions continue to run down low single, uh, uh, down mid single, which I, th I have found to always be a pretty good proxy for the war heater market. So against that sort of backdrop, you know, maybe give us a little more color around the two and a half percent local currency um, guidance for China, if you would. Particularly if you can give us an idea of when you think it pivots positive within that context. Yeah, I mean, let, let, let me start out with uh, we look Q1. You know, as we came into looking at next year, we thought Q1 was going to be a challenging year, regardless of what you're hearing on the virus situation right now. And the reason we we have a little caution on Q1 is because the uh, Chinese New Year's Festival uh, falls into January. And any time it falls, it was January 25th, any time it falls into January, what we see is more an eruption uh, in the appliance market, less, less traction. So as Kevin kind of outlined on his introductory remarks, uh, even without those considerations, we see the Q1, um, you know, in China to be a, a challenging Q1 because of the disruption of the earlier holiday. Um, we would expect, though, going out of Q1, um, I think you've got a pretty spot-on uh, take on, on some of our assumptions, Scott. Um, so, you know, we, we expect going out of Q1, we're going to see a little headwind on channel inventory still. We're really happy with the progress that we made this year, getting down into that normal range. We would expect another couple weeks, perhaps, come out of next year through the, through the back three quarters of the year. 
Um, low single digit or low single digit declines on the water heating, heating side are really consistent with what we've seen this year and kind of roll into next year in our assumptions. Um, water treatment, that, you know, the, if we look at our outside market data, you know, some of those numbers are, are slightly, slightly negative. Um, we're a little more optimistic on the water treatment side. Uh, we really like some of the new products we put out and we're just, we think we're going to outperform some of those projections on, on, on water treatment. So, and then you kind of roll into that, so some of the other, I'll call it, you know, less material categories that we have that kind of bringing up to that growth rate. Thank I hope you. that's helpful. And our next question comes from Robert McCarthy with Stevens. Please proceed with your question. Hi, everybody. Well, first of all, um, good luck managing the situation. Obviously, this is going to be dynamic, and the human toll is going to be uh, pretty challenging. Um, and I guess, you know, it's like the old John Lennon quote, you know, life is what happens when you're making other plans. But how are you, how are you going to, you know, kind of come back to the market and kind of give us a sense of what you think is kind of fundamental end market demand in China um, versus the disruption you're going to see? Are, are we going to see a non-recurring charge uh, in association with, uh, w with what happens in China? Are you going to give some kind of mid-year update on association with that? And then part and parcel of that, you know, what's, what's, what are you, how are you going to manage recourse in the channel for, for inventory? I mean, is there any force majeure we have to worry about? Just give us some sense about what we're going to see in terms of the disruption to what is your, your guide, which was clearly baked and contemplated prior to uh, these events. I, this is Kevin. Let me take that. I, I, those are all really good questions. And, but right now, when you, when you look at this market and you look at the coronavirus and where it stands, it's really too early to, to speculate. Um, we still have many people on holiday that need to come back, and, and we see how they're going to behave going forward. We don't know the scope of, you know, outside the, the key provinces that, that have been uh, restricted right now. So if you just step back from that, um, we're going to have to get a, a lot more data on how consumers are behaving before we, we enter into some um, further guidance and speculation. It's, it, it's where we're at. Where you at today? Okay, fair enough. And you know, turning to North America, um, you know, obviously, um, you, you did talk about the phenomenon of uh, you know potentially lower all-in growth uh, than you've, you've witnessed in years past. Um, you know, what are you seeing in terms of um, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know in, in, in terms of your end markets, in terms of the shift to tankless gas and and, and how are you feeling about kind of where you're positioned from a market share perspective there? Um, and, and do you think that still supports kind of still, you know, reasonable kind of low, you know, low single-digit growth here uh, for the foreseeable future? Yeah, I think on the – let's just take from the, from the a market share perspective. Um, and remember, th these are shipments. These are not sellouts. Yeah. But, but if you look at it, um, you know, we were down a bit on, on market share residential. We were up a, uh, close to 100 basis points on commercial. And, and as we go in, into this year, we just look at it re returning to a, a, a more normal level. And I look at the residential business and the res residential industry. Over in 10 years, it's been flat twice, down three times, and up five. So it, 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 it's not this linear equation, it, it, but you look at the positive news from a new construction standpoint, you look at a water being a must-have uh, product um, when, again, it, it stops operating. So our guidance is really getting back to a historical levels, and, and I think that's a reasonable guidance as we go forward. Our share is intact on both residential and commercial. And to go back on tankless, um, that's an area that we, we continue to – uh, look at growing, expanding. We will be introducing some new innovative product lines this year. And, and, and that category actually has declined three years in a row, uh, the, 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 its growth rate. So overall, I think we're in good position as we, we head in. I think the guidance is kind of getting back to a, a normal year um, that we basically didn't have in, in 2019. Thank you. And our next question comes from Michael Halloran with Baird. Please proceed with your question. Hey, morning, everyone. Morning. Um, so, so first on China, just some thoughts on how you think the market share 
trends are on both the water heater side as well as the treatment side in China, um, what you could point to, and then any delineation between how you think you're doing in on the water heater side and in the upper tier versus the middle tier where I know you've been introducing a, a higher end mid tier product. Yeah, let me let me just start out with that one, Mike, on the on the share. So, you know, we look at it online, offline, all the caveats that we've heard before. We use a couple different triangulations to get there and not all of our stores are uh, are covered in the specialty side, but on the offline, what we're really looking at is quarter over quarter, if you take heating, uh, both gas and electric, we're relatively flat quarter over quarter. If you move into water treatment, we're up a couple hundred basis points quarter over quarter, so we're pleased with that uh, that, that little movement up on the water treatment side. For the year, uh, on the offline, it's you know down a couple hundred basis points on heating and, uh, um, collectively, and we've held our share on water treatment. If you go to online, uh, heating, both the residential, I'm sorry, both electric and gas is, is rel- relatively flat for the quarter, and we're up about 100 basis points on water treatment. For the year, if you look online, we're down about a, a point on, on all three categories. So we're, you know, we're, we're pleased with the water treatment in particular, and we're, we're fairly holding on the other, uh, on the other category. And Michael, Michael, also just Michael, to expand, you, you asked on the, um, the upper tier premium market, um, you know, I look at Q4. There wasn't a lot of change. The uh, the upper tier stayed where it was, and it's down at about a couple hundred basis points, and that's been pretty consistent throughout the year. Um, as important from a brand perspective, there's been no real retaliation towards a foreign or American brand. So really, we came through Q4 relatively um, kind of the same as we thought, with no real changes. Other than we have you know, filled in our medium price points, and we feel good about that going into 2020. Appreciate it there. And then uh, on North America side, uh, maybe just an update on the treatment business. You sound pretty constructive on progress you've made. So any thoughts on how the channel build's going and, and custom receptivity at this point and how you think the build-out of that market's going? Because it's still in the early stage of a build-out. It, it is an early stage. Uh, we, we had – I. A very good year, uh, mid-teens growth. Uh, we saw core growth in all segments, and you know that's our direct-to-consumer, that's a professional water quality dealer, retail, and, 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 and wholesale as well. So overall, um, we, we feel pretty good about the um, the way the business is moving forward. Uh, increased productivity, as I mentioned in my re- remarks in our plants, uh, on-time performance is up, and again. Part of our thesis is that water quality is becoming a bigger issue with consumers, and we see that uh, continuing uh, not only with lead, but PFOAs and a number of other contaminants that are, that are in the market. And we feel comfortable because we, we have the products uh, that can, um, can, can re- remove all these chemicals, and, and, um, and, and so the business is, is in good shape, had a good year, and we look forward to building on it in 2020. Yeah, from a numbers perspective, we're right on track to what we've been talking about. Is going into next year, we look at, you know, revenues in the 170 to 180 range. We look at, uh, we, you know, operating margins in double digits. So we're we're pleased um, with the continued progress. Thank you. And our next question comes from Jeffrey Heyman with Keybank. Please proceed with your question. Hey, good morning, guys. Morning. Hi. I just want to um, make sure I'm, I, I'm clear on the, the guidance. So I think you're saying 45 to 5.5% uh, growth. And it just seems like a lot of these numbers are kind of low single digits, you know, commercial res, you know, China. So, like, what, what's kind of growing above average outside of uh, lock and bar to kind of get you into that 45 to 5.5% growth range? Yeah, I mean, so Lock and Bar goes back to growth. So we see Lock and Bar at that 8% next next year. So that that helps in, in walking it forward. We also we also have growth in North America water treatment. So we expect North America water treatment to grow in that low teens year over year, and that's starting to become a more meaningful base. India, we expect to grow also. India is in that low teens range that we expect to continue to grow. So that's that's the major components, you know. The rest, you know, China is rather rather modest, but will be positive, or at least our assumptions are that it will be positive. Okay, and then um, just a couple questions on China. One, um, 
It looks like I think you closed 700 stores in 19. You're going to close another thousand in 2020. I think is what you said. Can you just talk about where store grow or stores are versus peak, and you know just any kind of revenue impact you think you have from all those store closures, and then just uh, you know any plans uh, for repatriating cash from China this year? Thanks. Yeah, so, you know, the store closures, and think of terms of the of those stores that are kind of in the same geographic region. So it's really rationalizing stores that are pretty close to another one, one another. So from a, a sales loss perspective, we don't view it as significant. What we view our job to do is to make sure we draw those, uh, those shoppers into the stores that exist within the geographic region that's there. You know, in some of the built-out years, we had, we, had, we had probably a little redundancy in some lo- uh, local areas. Um, so the peak, you know, the peak was about 9,800, and today, you know, we'd be nine. about nine. Yeah, so about 9,000. So, um, you know, going forward, that, that extra 1,000 stores that we're looking at is, is probably not a significant impact on sales. Uh, and just a reminder that, you know, there, there's, some of those are, are specialty stores. Some of those are retail outlets. You know, the, the costs for those, they do incur a cost to support some of those stores, but it's our customers' storefronts, so the closure cost on some of those is just not not very significant. Thank you, and our next question comes from Brian Blair with Oppenheimer. Please proceed with your question. Morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. Hi. Hey, Brian. Uh, following up on Scott's initial line of questioning, um, asking from a slightly uh, slightly higher level, where do you think we stand in terms of the long-term replacement cycle? You know, is there risk of you know, an accelerated move off of peak there? And, and any differences between the resi and commercial side, you would call that? We, we did quite a bit of uh, analysis on this and, and uh, reviewed it in our investor day and continue to watch it, quite frankly. The, the, the bell curve on a replacement cycle on water heaters is, is really e- elongated. We have water heaters that can go out within five years and others that can last 25 years. So as we've looked at it, we, um, we, we see that bell curve smoothing out, and we don't see, and I'll use the word because people have used it in the past, a cliff. We see it going out to 22, 23, um, maybe a slight decline, but, but nothing um, – of, of any dramatic nature. We're even seeing some of our products even last even a little bit longer. We've been using 14 years and, and then the, the moving out to 15 years. So it's, from our perspective, it's, uh, it's out a few years and the impact will be within that one or two point range. And, and I guess the follow up, Brian, Brian, you mentioned commercial. The cycle on commercial is shorter, so we really just don't see the same uh, tracking uh, as residential. It's just a shorter life cycle. Got it. It's helpful. Uh, moving to China, um, obviously there's a P&L hit to start the year. Then barring spillover effect from the, the virus, seems like there will be a decent reset, you know, at least into the back half. How should we think about ROW uh, margin cadence throughout the year netting to that mid-single digit range? Well, typically in China, our strongest quarter is Q4. You know, so, um, uh, you know, I, I think you can look at it that way. It was the strongest quarter this year for us, even though it was down a little bit from consumer demand compared to last year. But, you know, we're, we're pleased with where we ended the year on, on channel inventory, where our customers ended the year on channel inventory. Uh, we would not expect, you know, in Q1 to, to, to cause that inventory to go up, and we would feel pretty good about coming into the back uh, three quarters of the year um, in that inventory condition, p- position compared to last year. But as far as cadence, I mean, the, the fourth quarter is always their strongest. Thank you. And our next question comes from David McGregor with Longbow Research. Please proceed with your question. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, you, may have met, you may have mentioned this and I may have missed it, but could you just talk about raw material prices and your guidance assumptions and uh, how you're thinking about lower steel prices in terms of the, the benefit to the P&L? Yeah, wait, for, for, for 2020, we're looking to have lower steel pricing than we have this year. Um, just as a reminder, you know, we, we see steel costs kind of 90 to 120 days um, hit us. Uh, so if you kind of look at where the market is today, 
Uh, we expect uh, steel pricing next year to be just slightly lower than where the market is today. And just so, can you is there any way of quantifying that back into the the margin guidance or the the EBIT guidance? You know, we t we typically don't, but um, you can you can kind of get a projection just by looking at kind of pegging it to the market. Sure. Sure. And then just with respect to China, um, can you just talk a little bit about your online sales there and um, I guess to what extent you may expect to see that accelerate as a consequence of the coronavirus, but I'm more interested in just how you feel you're positioned uh, in terms of market share or, or channel share on that on that platform. So our online, our online sales last year were $207 million, really pretty flat to the year before. Um, you know, we, we've got our assumption in 2020 to grow at its uh, mid-single digits. Um, so, we, you know, we've talked about reintroducing mid-price products, so we feel pretty good about our position with mid-price products, which we do see more of on online sales. Um, and, and, you know, our share, we, we still think there's opportunity to grow that share on the online side. Um, so it's, you know, it's 207 this year, and we'd be growing mid-single digits. We, we, we feel pretty pretty good with where we enter into 2020. Thank you. And our next question comes from Larry DeMario with William Blair. Please proceed with your question. Uh, thanks. Good morning. Um, uh, first question, um, the price actions you guys took second half, 19, how do they hold up through the rest of 19? Uh, I don't know if there's any pushback in the market, et cetera, and how are you thinking about you know, price in 2020? Um, Pricing question is always fairly sensitive to us. You know, as we we announced, we we did put an increase through last year up to four um, percent. And really, after that, we, you know, we're really the only public company, and we just don't want to comment any further on any any pricing actions with regards to uh, market conditions. Right. Well, I know you guys are always been historically sensitive to that, but I'm curious if it held up through the rest of 19, or if there was push back in the channel, um, you know, broadly speaking, on price. Yeah, again, we we're just not going to comment on price uh, with, with any detail like that. Okay. Um, and then secondly, in uh, China, can you talk about that two to three months of inventory that you guys, or that it's in the channel, um, is that uh, high-end inventory, mid-tier inventory, first of all, and secondly, as it relates to the coronavirus uh, which obviously, you know, Grand Zero is in Wuhan. I think some of your competitors are there uh, with fairly big production plants. Um, you guys said that, you know, no big impact to your supply chain as far, but are you seeing or potentially seeing any interruptions in the market from potentially in the industry from competitors because of what's going on in Wuhan? Sure, just, uh, just to start with the channel inventory. So our channel inventory, you know, I'll, I'll call it, it's, it's a relatively even mix of, you know, higher-end product, mid-price product. As you know, We've introduced quite a few mid price products in the last two to three quarters, so it's maybe it's, I'll call it 50-50. So we think we're we're balanced on on, on where 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 it falls out on the channel inventory. Um, with respect to, I, I would say with, with respect to competitors, um, and in the like I had mentioned before, it's really too early to understand. I mean, what I tell you from our supply chain, we we did reach out to our our suppliers and so forth, and, and got feedback and. And, and we're comfortable with it, but um, we just don't have the information, nor are we going to speak uh, to any of our competitors' conditions. Thank you. And our next question comes from Susan McCleary with Goldman Sachs. Please proceed with your question. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Hi. Susan. Um, I, I just wondered if we could talk a little bit about, you know, what are you seeing in terms of the new construction side of the U.S. market, especially on the residential piece of reporting some good order growth, and how are you thinking about that coming through? From a uh, residential new construction, again, you look at there's been some positive information uh, with builders. Uh, certainly, uh, there was a, a spike in, in, in starts in, in December. So if you look forward, it looks like a, from a new construction standpoint, it, it, uh, it's a positive, um, it, it's a tailwind to, to what, ex, what extent. Chuck talked about 100,000 units. On the commercial side, again, I, things have been active there. Uh, however, th there's just been a, you know, items being, being pushed out. The labor is still an issue, I would tell you, on both the residential and, and the commercial side of the business. 
So um, it's, it's, it, it looks positive to us to the, the degree that we can get things in the ground and finished. Um, we think it, it's within our guidance of the, the range we gave on residential and our guidance that we gave on our commercial and boilers. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then, you know, obviously your balance sheet remains in a really strong position with a net cash uh, balance there. Can you just talk about maybe what you're seeing in terms of some of the M&A opportunities and how you're thinking about some of the capital allocation, um, you know, things that could come up over the course of 2020? Well, uh, normally, we're, on the M&A side, we're always actively engaged in, in, in looking for opportunities and and until we have any that are really materializing, we just don't talk about them. Uh, however, we are we do have a nice balance sheet that when those opportunities come along, uh, we can execute. When it comes from our cash um, allocation, I'll have Chuck just comment on. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're we're looking to repurchase next year. Um, so as we've talked about before, we always invest in ourselves. We've got some good capital programs that we're we're planning for next year. We're we're we're, we're looking at uh, repurchasing about 200 million. Um, that 200 million is really based on what we look at for generating cash for the year, um, our dividends, um, net of, of capex, and you know the the the, for, the the goal. What we're looking at to, to size that, uh, barring an acquisition, would be just an acro cash for 2020. Um, so that's kind of how we're sizing that um, that up. Thank you. And our next question comes from Robert McCarthy with Stevens. Please proceed with your question. Huh. Yeah, this is back in queue with a couple of follow-ups. Thank you for taking the questions. Um, you know, the, the first would be just in terms of looking at historical trends in, in the residential channel in North America. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, historically, I, I hear your point about the fits and starts in, in terms of how you're thinking about the kind of the replacement cycle developing. But, you know, you did go through a period of, pretty significant price increase with that standard change five years ago, which created a different margin structure, which could attract new entrants in the market. So, I mean, how do you think of about prospectively uh, the threat of new entrants in the context of the replacement cycle, uh, you know, maybe, maybe challenging your historical assumptions about how the cycle is going to play out? Well, let me just take you how, how, how we look at it. One, to, to be a market leader in this industry, um, you, you have to have a broad line of products, both residential, commercial, and, um, and and that investment. And that's not only in the products, but in, in the tech, the, you know, the technologies, you, condensing, non-condensing, heat pump, non-heat pump, uh, gas tankless, electric tankless, all the commercials we have are tanks. So, you know, from a, a new entrant, uh, that's always possible. And, Quite frankly, uh, Hire has announced that they're going to come into the market with, with some electric products. But as we look at it, you know, what we do is we try to provide the best value proposition to our customers, and it's based upon this broad portfolio. It's based upon driving value not only with products, services, and also what we do in the uh, uh, with engineers and, and specifications. And then on top of that, you really step back. We've got 60 years of long-term re relationships in all channels. So we're going to do um, the things that we believe make us the preferred uh, brand of choice. And, and so that's how we look at it. And, and as other people come in, um, it's going to take a broad portfolio. It's, it's, it's not an easy hurdle to come in and provide these, these, uh, these broad portfolio of products and services that we have. And then the final question for me is, I mean, um, you know, I think with the exception of probably Lock and Bar, most of the growth initiatives are the positive growth variants to get the, get the kind of the 4 to 5% growth or the mid-single-digit growth are going to be, you know, in, in you know, decent growing businesses, businesses you're investing in, uh, but, you know, clearly going to be um, challenging margin mix profile for you as a whole, uh, at least on a normalized basis for China and certainly for North America. So are you concerned about that, particularly in the context of what could be, you know, a rougher uh, traffic coming in, in, in China, that, um, you know, the nature of the growth that you're going to see is, is, is dilutive and, 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 may, and may create some incremental, uh, you know, earnings risk or headwinds, even to your base outlook? You know, you're, you're correct in the fact that some of these growth businesses right now have lower, lower operating margins than what, you know, the, the lesser growth business going forward. 
Um, China is difficult to, you know, peg uh, as far as, you know, um, <laughs> China, China, we pegged China. We said, you know, what our growth rate would, would be next year. And that, um, so I, you know, it, China, we expect to continue to reduce product costs. We, could, we expect to continue to look at our costs and expect to expand the margin in China at the pace at which the consumer confidence and market allows us to grow. Um, in India and water treatment, you know, we're, we feel like we're making good progress in India. We expect to be break even next year. Water treatment, we're looking at, you know, one to two uh, hundred basis points improvement in the next couple of years to get that margin closer to North America water heating. So we, we feel like we're making progress on all those areas. Thank you. And our next question comes from Jeffrey Hammond with KeyBank. Please proceed with your question. Hey guys, um, just a, I want to go back on the repatriation. Any plans to uh, to repatriate cash from China this year? You know, in the last two years, we've uh, repatriated 150 million each year. Um, we're going through that process and looking at the things that are in front of us. Um, we would expect to repatriate some cash, and you know, when we when we come up with the uh, appropriate number as we go through that process, we'll. You know, we'll be talking about how much we how much we bring back, but we we would expect to, and we have in the last two years brought back 150 million. Okay. Each year. And then, okay, great. And then, um, on your North American margins, your range is typically like 25 to 50 bips, but this year you have a 100 basis point range. And just wanted to understand the change, or if there's any moving pieces that would support the the wider range. Thanks. You know, it's it, it's mostly within our range. It's mostly just based on volume assumptions. That's what drives the most of the of the volatility. Thank you, and I'm not showing any further questions at this time. I'll now turn the call over to Patricia Ackerman for any further remarks. Great, thank you for joining us on our call today. We will participate in one conference in the first quarter. That's the Benning and Scattergood Conference in London on March 12th. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.